Jess, are you ready for rapid fire? I am ready for rapid fire. I think All right. we, we need a little relief now. <laughs> We've got plenty tonight. And I, I'm, I'm curious to see if we get any input from our listeners on this first question. Fill in the blank. The anniversary of Brian Kelly leaving Notre Dame for LSU should be called blank going forward. Uh, Brian Kelly leaving Notre Dame for LSU should be called an opportunity going forward because of what we just talked about uh, previously. An opportunity for the program to reach new heights and get to a level that we've all been wanting, right? The national championship. I believe with Marcus Freeman that Notre Dame has a better chance at winning the national championship than they did with Brian Kelly. Is it going to, are we set back maybe a couple years or a year or two? Sure, because that's, you know, that's that's accustomed to any time a new coaching staff comes through. And like we talked about getting his recruits in there, getting his guys, his cycle going. I think that we, it is an opportunity uh, to, to reach new heights uh, compared to, to when Brian Kelly was here. So it's opportunity to reach new heights day. Is that what we're, is that what Jesse is calling it? Yes. <laughs> I, I forgot that there was a day at the end of there. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. We could call it like Kelly's run, you know, BK bolts day or something like that. You know, Brian's Baton Rouge bolt. Like if you're Dom Merriweather, you know, you could say you could call it the, uh, the negative burnt ends day or something like that you know like i'll never get my burn ins back t-max says blessing day that see that's that that could fit yeah. in it's a blessing yeah. because we're gonna get to new better heights vsb victory in south bend day from tommy that's not a bad <laughs> one either or just call it freeman era day right or freeman day or you know remember the hashtag that was going around that week free, free day you know, hashtag freeman era it's you know kelly left it brought you the freeman era so just call it just call it that, but VSB day or VND day, you know, that's not bad either. So I, I would just, I would just go with, with, with Freeman era day, something along those lines. All right. So this is what I was alluding to earlier. Here's something you've brought up before on this show and some hard data now to go along with it. So Notre Dame's red zone defense ranks 130th out of 131 teams in the nation. This is red zone defense. They have allowed touchdowns 78.8% of the times that teams have gotten into the red zone. But at the same time, opponents only have gotten into the red zone 33 times this season, which ranks number 15 in the nation. And again, this is something you brought up, Jesse. They're, you know, they're not good keeping teams out of the end zone once they get into the red zone, but they're actually pretty good for the most part at keeping teams out of the red zone. So, Mr. Defense, what do you think of this? Yeah, I just I, – I, I remember going through this probably like six weeks ago being very frustrated because all people wanted to talk about or, you know, associate with – Golden's defense was this red zone rate, you know, uh, that, that someone brought up. And so it was very frustrating because, yeah, that stat is bad. You don't – of course I want you – know, you don't want that, that you know, to be 130 at 131, and you would like to see that percentage drop. But at the same time, it, you can still – he still has a good defense because teams weren't getting to the red zone often. It was just, you know, when they did get there, for whatever reason, they were scoring touchdowns. And so for me, I, I am – very satisfied with being number 15 in the country of, you know, teams getting into the red zone. I would just like to see that that red zone number come down a little bit, even if teams aren't getting there very often, I guess. It's like that number still isn't good, but the fact that, they, you know, teams don't get into the red zone very often is right. still a very good stat. It's in my still opinion. a good sign, and it, it goes to the fact that, like, even USC, they scored 38 points, but Notre Dame held them below their scoring average. I think it was every game this season, Notre Dame held teams below their scoring average all season long. And it was, you know, in, in some cases, pretty considerable. So the defense was actually pretty good. It's just like if you go back again to the USC game, and I don't know how much of this plays into these specific stats that we're talking about with the red zone, the lack of being able to adjust when teams are having some success, like what they had the other night. You know, like he made a preemptive move by going with that 3-3-5 defense the other night. And Lincoln Riley and USC said, okay, you're going to give us a three-man front 
we're going to attack it. And they end up running for 204 yards. Where was the adjustment that came after that? You know, that we, where was the adjustment in the second half against Navy, for example? You know, like there have been good, there have been bad, but where was the, you know, like they, it's, it's, it's really, it's really baffling to me. One of the conundrums, I think, of looking at this Al Golden defense because there was a lot of good, but there was just enough bad that it, it leaves you a little bit perplexed, leaves you wondering a little bit exactly what it is. Yeah, so here, here's how I'm going to put it uh, in, in big term pictures. Out of the 12 games this season, Notre Dame won eight of them. Uh, uh, they obviously lost four. Of those four losses, I would say that the defense is to blame in one of them, and that's the USC game. They didn't lose to Ohio State because of their defense. They didn't right. lose to Marshall and Stanford because of their defense. Uh, they only lost, uh, in my now, opinion. Let's go back to Marshall, though. With with you know when when they the had third a down in their Marshall, own in their own territory. I when get they've that. got a chance to get Marshall off the field, and it turns into what a 95, 96 yard touchdown drive. That's you know. That's, I guess what I'm trying to say is I'm leaning towards, and, and most of their losses, uh, I would say that it was offensive production. I think that you can squarely blame the defense for one game, and that's USC. And if that, as a defensive coordinator, I will take that. I will, you know, that's a, a pretty solid defense, in my opinion. And the fact that that one loss was, again, against a very high powered offense, a Heisman, a guy who's probably going to win the Heisman. I'm not trying to make excuses, but he, Golden had a lot that he was working up against against USC, but like you said, there had to be some sort of – you needed to see at least signs or efforts of trying to change things. There was just not enough in-game uh, adjustments. Yeah, and like Anthony says, they still only gave up 19 points to Marshall. You know, But again, it's kind of like what I was just talking about. Like They played relatively well for a good chunk of the game, but then when the game was on the line and you really needed to step up, 90 plus yard touchdown drive you know so that's you you got to get off the field on third and long you know that's that's basically what it comes down to they get off the field on third and long they probably walk out of there with a win and we're talking about a completely different topic today yeah but then you know again on the the flip side for me is if you if you told me that the offense needed just 20 points to beat Marshall. It's how can't you score 20 points against Marshall? Uh, you know, it's just it, it's hard to to look at it uh, from both sides. Andrew's asking what we think about Freeman calling the defense next season, and he's really taken, you know, more a CEO approach to this whole thing. What is it? Letting you know, letting off his offensive coordinator do his thing, letting his defensive coordinator doing his thing, even though he was just obviously defensive coach. But like when he was talking about Lincoln Riley last week, Lincoln Riley is obviously a head coach, but he was talking about what a great offensive coordinator Lincoln Riley also is. So I, I get, you know, you've brought in this guy, Al Golden, who's a former head coach himself. He's got a lot of NFL experience and, you know, he's got a lot of experience in general. I get not wanting to sort of step on his toes, but at the same time, Marcus Freeman's strength is defense. And like his defenses throughout the course of last season, there was, you know, there were some mistakes early where they gave up some big plays. I, I'll be, I would, I would not, I would not shoot down the idea myself. I don't know. I'll be really curious to see, like, as Marcus Freeman evaluates everything, and I'm sure he's going to evaluate everything if he if he thinks that that is a direction he needs to go next year. I wouldn't I like, be against it, but you know, there's ahead. a couple couple things on that. Is I, I like that the approach that he took this season, letting his coordinators kind of come to him when he needed to, you know, provide the support of what he needed. Uh, but at the same time, you got to realize that Golden is in his first year too. He has been out of the college game for a little bit. The game is different between college and NFL, and what you can do schematically and what you're trying to accomplish. So I think if we continue to maybe see some of the same issues again next season, then, the, then, the, then yeah, there is a potential, you know, for Freeman to step in. But I thought Irish and Ohio made a good point. I think Freeman should get back with the linebackers. I think that's his bread and butter. We saw a very big weakness this year at linebackers. I think that was their biggest, that was obviously, you know, their biggest weakness on defense. And I would like to see Marcus Freeman with a more of an input with these linebackers, and especially because it's so young. This group is going to be so raw. There's a lot of yeah. talent there, and I'd like to see Marcus Freeman get his hands in that a little bit. 
And I mean, they had two guys coaching them. They brought in James Laurinaitis and Al Golden was the linebackers coach as well. And they still, you know, again, it is, is some of the reason because of, you know, like some of these guys are, are limited athletically in different ways versus you've got these young guys who have a lot more upside coming up behind them. But these front end guys are all going to be here most likely next year versus, you know, so is it that versus was there a lot on their plate? I thought the linebacker play got better over the course of the year, but there were still definite areas for improvement for them. Yes, definitely. Next question. Does David Shaw's decision to step down at Stanford make you look at Notre Dame's season any differently? No, I, I think that, that Shaw has been on a, a drought now for the last three or four years. And, you know, after he replaced Harbaugh, he had, you know, Stanford was good. They, they He kind of continued or picked up where Harbaugh left off, but he's really struggled the last three or four years. And so, you know, whether or not Shaw resigns or not, that's just an ugly loss to a bad Stanford team. But he's he's been struggling now for a couple of years. This isn't just a you know, a one-year thing or two-year thing. This is an accumulation of his last three or four or five years, and I, I, it doesn't really have any effect, uh, in my opinion. See, but that's why, to me, it does make me kind of go just, you know, the Stanford loss is what it is at this point. Before USC, that was the last loss that they had. They had done pretty well for a while. But it's one thing to be eight and four, and, we, you know, we know the losses, Marshall, Stanford, and then, you know, Ohio State and USC, but as much as losing to Marshall stinks, at least Marshall ended up going eight and four. You know, they're still a fairly average group of five team, but at least they're bowl eligible and they, they ended up with eight wins this season. They, you know, they went through a valley there for a while losing those four games. And so, you know, to Tommy Gunn's point, no, it's still a disappointment. And that's kind of part of my point. It's like, to me, it stings even more because, okay, yeah, Marshall had 20 transfers. It was early in the season, you know, the, before the Notre Dame's offensive line came together, new head coach, all that stuff. Okay, whatever. But what makes me look at things a little bit differently with Stanford now is, like, they take even fewer transfers than Notre Dame. They had lost 11 straight games to Power 5 teams. And they only won one more game after beating Notre Dame. That was the next week when they beat Arizona State, who also fired their head coach this season. So, you know, they finished with their third losing season in four years. Despite all that, David Shaw wasn't going to get fired. He was going to get to keep his job, apparently, if he wanted it. But he waves the, the you know, the, the flag, no moss, I'm done, I'm out of here. And so, like, that's, that's one of the teams that you lost to. Like, to me, it's it just – it's still a head scratcher. Again, they were able to recover and get better after that. But it's like, how on earth you lost that game? Because now, like, how much this matters, I don't know. But if they had won that game, they're nine and three right now with a bowl game coming up. They've still got a chance at another double digit win season. You know, that's that's out the window right now. Again, how much that matters, I don't know. It's probably, you know, relatively just a feather in your cap, but it's it's just it's just so confounding and makes it even more frustrating to 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 know that of all the things that that did go well, you know, a pretty good record against ranked teams. You lost, you know, you're only outside of Marshall and Stanford, you lost to a couple top five teams. That's great. But that that was the team that you lost to to a guy who ultimately jumped off a sinking ship at the end of the season. That's a little bit distressing still. Again. They they played better since then, but it's still distressing that that that's one of the teams that you ended up losing to. I think definitely. I, I think it does make it sting just a little bit more. Yeah. So this next one, I saw this the other day, and I had to bring this up. So the voice, the radio voice of Arkansas football, Chuck Barrett, he took some shots at Missouri last week. Uh, mostly talking about the lack of quality in their facilities in comparison to Arkansas. He said, quote, I don't think they take their sports seriously. I don't think it just means more. They act like they're a little bit better than those of us in the Southern Corridor. I've just never cared for them, end quote. So after the game, Missouri beats Arkansas, and Missouri head coach, 
Eli Drinkwitz says, quote, anybody sees Chuck Barrett, ask him how our trenches were, end quote. So what do you think of this, Jess? You know, I just, I don't understand why people run their mouths before the, the event is actually over, right? Like say what you want to say after it's over, but when you make comments like this, you're just giving people receipts to just bury you after the game and whether or not, you know, Missouri takes football as seriously um, as Arkansas, you know, that's, that's, that's a here nor there conversation, but I just don't think it's really in the, in people like that's, you know, position to be kind of making those shots because you're only setting yourself up for if things go bad, right? Like, of course, if you win, no one's going to say anything. But when you say something like that and you lose, you just give the other guy ammunition to, to send it right back at you. And you look even stupider because for the reason that, you know, they lost. And then, and then so it becomes of, okay, Arkansas, we, they, we don't take football as serious, or sorry, Missouri, we don't take football as seriously as Arkansas, but we just beat you. So what does that say? You know, who's Who's really taking the football seriously? So, I just wish that people would save their comments for when the, for when the game is actually over or when things yeah. have actually concluded. Yeah, you know, I'm surprised that that Barrett said what he said, but I'm but it's also like with Eli Drinkwitz, this guy is interesting because like I remember seeing him at SEC Media Days and he gets up there and he's got his little glasses, you know, it's like his wire rim glasses on. He looks like a professor up there. He doesn't look like a football coach, but then you see him on the sidelines and this guy is like. He's he's animated, you know, he's going at it, he's going after people and the whole thing. But why the rabbit ears, Eli Drinkwitz? That's what I <laughs> want to know about. Why the rabbit ears? Why do you care what the Arkansas radio announcer is saying? You know, and and why are you bringing it up in your post-game press conference? Like your jab is at the Arkansas radio <laughs> announcer. It's like he was waiting all game for that. Yeah. Yeah. It's like that was the motivation, you know, so we can throw it back at the Arkansas radio announcer. So that's – I just – you know, I guess it, it just goes to show. Some of these guys will tell you that they don't listen, they don't read, you know, the the stuff, whatever, but they do. It gets you know? to them. Just ask yeah. Lane Kiffin. I think Lane Kiffin sees everything. Oh, yeah. <laughs> sure. For sure. It, you know, if he would put down the Twitter, he wouldn't see as much. But. Right. Exactly. Storm, I guess so. So in last night's loss to the Steelers, did you watch that game Steelers Colts last night? Watch the whole thing, actually. OK, so you know what I'm talking about here. Colts get the ball back their own seven yard line, 352 to play all three timeouts left. They're down by a touchdown after a Matt Ryan 14 yard scramble with under a minute to play. The Colts lose 25 seconds because Jeff Saturday doesn't call a timeout. The game ends with the Colts at the Steelers 26. They've got two timeouts left at the end of the game because they didn't use them. After the game, Saturday says, I thought we had plenty of time. I wasn't really concerned. So, Jess, how concerned should Colts fans be about having Saturday as their coach right now? You know, I think there shouldn't be a lot of concern because first and foremost, they got rid of their head coach in the middle of the season. And that was largely because of the abundance of talent they had and the, and the shot that they thought that they had at winning the division. And unfortunately, they were underperforming and they bring in Saturday. And if I'm not mistaken, he already had two wins as a head coach, you know. So it's like I, I, I don't think that people should be relatively concerned about it because one, he's an interim and two, He's on a better track record than the than the guy that started, you know, that started the season ahead of him. And I think another important aspect of this is one, I I kind of was I see the rationale for why he didn't take the time out. He he thought that he had the Steelers defense reeling and that he had, you know, he didn't want to take the time out and give the Steelers the opportunity to sub out defensively. And he didn't want to give them a line change. And so I understand those things. And I thought Troy Aikman brought up another great point last night and, and you know, afterwards talking to Scott Van Pelt. It, it's not just a Jeff Saturday decision. He's got guys in the press box who are solely dedicated to clock management and telling him when or when he shouldn't take a timeout. And so we don't know if they were telling him to take a timeout and he point blank said no, or if right. they were all on the same page of we're just going to let this roll. And, you know, we want to keep, keep the Steelers kind of reeling here because of they, you know, they, they were ripping off, not ripping off, but they were moving the ball and they just didn't want to give the Steelers a breather or the chance to kind of switch guys out. So I'm not making excuses. I still think that there should have been a timeout taken, but I can see the other side of where things were, were going in that, in that situation. 25 seconds is a lot of time to let run off the clock when you've got all your timeouts 
remaining. Because I think wasn't it on the next play? You know, like after the next play, they ended up taking the ticket because there was a sack that Ryan took as well, where they didn't take a timeout. So like right. you you know you can talk about having them reeling, but you were kind of reeling a little bit yourself. Like maybe you could have stood to regroup. It just seems like you know this this is a guy again who you know everyone everyone. You know, Jim Ert from Jer- Jim Ursay on down started patting themselves on the back after he went out and beat the Raiders in his first game. And just like I said, I mean, that's no accomplishment. Josh McDaniels is not a good head coach, and the Raiders are not a good team. It's like you had two bad teams playing. Somebody had to win. And teams get up when they have an interim coach. Uh, you, you, you've seen it quite a bit. The, the uh, Carolina Panthers, after Rule got fired, they went out and won a game or two afterwards you know it's like and then then all all of a sudden that emotion kind of dies off and you've got what you got this just seems like basic mistakes made by an inexperienced coach and you know he can say that that he wasn't worried about it and all that but it just to leave a game like that 26 yards shy of the end zone with two timeouts in your pocket you don't get to use them down the road it just and i don't know it, it seemed to me like a big mistake, like a big rookie mistake that he made. Fill in the blank. It's blank that the Dallas Cowboys versus New York Giants drew an audience of 42 million on Thanksgiving Day. Biggest viewership for a regular season game ever. You know, Vince and I got into this a little bit uh, similar question on Saturday in the pregame show. And so I'm hoping that we have some people out there that either one, listen and can hear me say this again, or two, are going to be hearing this for the first time. Anytime the Cowboys play and it gets high viewership, it's expected because <laughs> they are America's team, everybody. This, is, this isn't this is brand new. This is who, who continues to set the records every time, the Dallas Cowboys. It's expected at this point that these guys are going to be the team that everyone wants to watch, and that's because you either love the Cowboys or you hate the Cowboys. So you're tuning in because you're a diehard fan or you'd like to see the Cowboys lose because you hate the Cowboys. But again, it all comes back to them being America's team. And that's, that's, that's why they get the viewership. That's why they get, you know, they're going to be playing the Colts on Sunday night football this week. They're always in prime time because they know the, the networks know who's going to set these viewership records. It's the Dallas yeah. Cowboys. And America gets the Colts in prime time two weeks in a row. We'll sit here and we'll pump, <laughs> we'll pump the Cowboys and uh, you know, something stupid will happen next week. But Specific to Cowboys and Giants, it's like perfect storm. Thanksgiving, everyone's off. It's a traditional. It's the four know, o'clock game. Everyone's yeah, got it's their four food in there. Thanksgiving, everyone's watching football anyway. And then you throw in America's team, the Dallas Cowboys. And then you throw in the number one media market in the country, New York. And both teams, you know, the, both teams are playing for something right now. They're both playoff teams as of right now. Uh, it probably means we're going to get more of it in the future. Like, remember when it seemed like every year the Cowboys and Giants would play on Sunday night to open the season? Like yes. You get them early on while they're both good and you get good ratings and all that, you know. So I, I'd be shocked if we don't see, like, Cowboys-Giants every third or fourth year on Thanksgiving going forward. I would be completely shocked. Exactly. So, just there were a lot of issues at the Las Vegas Invitation Women's Basketball Tournament over the weekend. Did you see this stuff on Twitter and kind of flow? No, I, I didn't. So, one of the basic things, there were no towels at the games for players. They told teams or, or teams were advised to bring their own towels down from their hotel rooms at the casino they were staying in. And they set up a basketball court in a hotel conference room to play games they had like folding chairs set up you know like ground level no scoreboard the whole thing my question i guess to you and you can comment on you know just this setup as well if you want what's the worst playing conditions that you've ever seen or played in um there's one situation that came to mind i always thought mishawaka's field in high school was kept poorly their field and we always played them when it rained so it flooded so that doesn't help but yeah. it was just a bad grass field and it just was it never felt really safe to play on and always advan- advantageous to the team that's running a downhill triple option as you're trying to get your feet footing in a very crappy field so i would say that and then when i was in college we played at a school called St. Xavier um in Illinois 
and their field they had this turf field but it might as well just been like a cinder block their their turf was really old Mm. it the pellets weren't you know it it wasn't it wasn't a turf field It, it felt like you were on like a very thin layer of concrete and so every time you know you were you were cautious of getting burns and cuts and all kinds. Of, it just it wasn't a good playing field. So I think of those two things when I think of just playing in, in bad conditions. But I also want to say, you know, I thought we were over this in, in the college bas- women's college basketball and women, you know, women's sports in general after the NCAA tournament a couple of years ago. So it's really sad um, and frustrating that we continue to see issues like this happen. And we don't really see it ever happen on the men's side. So that's another comment I wanted to get in there. No, I mean. You- that's exactly right. You know, just like the whole stuff of the NCAA tournament a couple of years ago, you would never see men's basketball teams asked to play in the same conditions. You would never see that happen. But, you know, that's what happened out there in Vegas. So it's 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 really, you know, like Indiana was one of the teams out there and they're a freaking top five team right now. Uh, to your point about the Mishawaka field, um, I don't know if it'll make you happy or sad to know that it's no better now <laughs> than it was then. I mean, it, there's a reason why it's a, it's a legit you know, advantage like to them. It's a, yeah, an advantage. Like he's, you know, a, a lot of these schools in the area are going to turf and he would love to have him some turf out there on his field. But instead, unfortunately there's sand spots and those kind of things. So uh, the worst that I saw we're because I don't think from a playing standpoint, you know, there's nothing that stands out. But when I was doing Notre Dame baseball games a few years back, they went to Mississippi Valley State one year and they played one of the games at like this really, really old, you know, like a stadium that was probably built literally in the 1920s or 30s, but it hadn't been used for several years. And when the team showed up to practice the day before, there were prison crews out on the field or yeah, with, with like those, you know, those, I don't know what you call it. You know, it's like the blades that you see where like they swing the blade and they're cutting the, you know, like the long grass with the, you know, like with like a rod, you know, with the blade attached to it. They're like yeah. literally they had inmates out on work duty trying to uh, get this field in condition to play. The grandstand was a mess. The field itself, was a mess. So uh that was uh that was one of the old uh Dave Schrag specials that trip to Mississippi <laughs> Valley State. So, I remember that actually. I remember yeah. you telling me about it. Sorry. Yeah, that was that's that's been a little been a little while. Salty wants you to whiteboard all the uh which coaching candidates were talked to and when and how far it went before Marcus Freeman was hired. That's something Vince and I talked about. I think it was just him. one person. So, I thought it was just Freeman and Freeman only. No, it was Fickle. We were we talked a little bit about oh, that. Oh, yeah, Freeman that's right. Fickle. Okay. But again, how deep it went, I don't know. But there was interest. And then uh, Rashomon. Is it Rashomon? Is that how you say it? Nice job for Notre Dame Women's Radio. We listened Saturday for a little bit. Thank you. Some big games coming up this week. That's right. Maryland on uh, Thursday, ACC Big Ten Challenge, and then UConn coming up Sunday. (laughs) Wants to know if I need a color guy. Uh, Might have a color person with me for this weekend, but I do appreciate the offer. Well, I think that's going to do it for tonight, Jess. We've uh, we've bore through it all. Tomorrow, of course, is mailbag day, so everyone's welcome to bring your questions in tomorrow. By the way, sling blades. There you go. That's right. Mm-hmm. Some of them French fried potatoes and sling blade. That's right. Thanks, Johnny S. Yes. Um, starting Friday, Vince and Jesse and I are going to do a special weekend edition of Rapid Fire. So we're going to start doing that um, as of this week. We're going to start it on Friday. I don't think it's going to be a live show, but uh, we're gonna we're gonna do it kind of record it in the afternoon and we'll have it for you on Friday for your weekend listening. So that'll be the next time we get a chance to talk with you. Jess? There was a, a question. Are, are, are Vincent, uh, Brian doing a, a reveal show tonight with the, the latest uh, college football rankings? Do you know? I think so, but no one really, you know, because I saw like the question about upon further review and no one has filled me in on what is or isn't happening in the last couple of days. You've been so, out of the country, so. Yeah, I think that there is supposed to be a uh, 
a show tonight? I, I would assume there is going to be because they've done one every week when the rankings are released. So I believe there's still going to be one. So that's as far as I can commit. <laughs> All right. Well, thanks for being with us tonight hit the like button on your way out if you would subscribe rate review all that great stuff helping out irish breakdown great to talk to you we will talk to you tomorrow with the mailbag show on ib nation sports talk